All right, so uh, kingdom. Uh, when we think about the kingdom of God, and uh, there is there has been books and books written, and I don't know if I've ever seen one book that has done justice uh, to the kingdom of God. Been a lot of attempts, and there's a lot of good material out there, uh, but it seems that it's one of those subjects that's a very very deep subject, many many levels to it. And a lot to it. Uh, but also, sometimes when we think about the kingdom of God, maybe in our minds, we see it as, as kind of more of a nebulous type of thing. It's not like you can feel it or touch it, as you want to say. And so we kind of think about the kingdom of God in an overarching way, and almost like it's not concrete, but more of kind of a nebulous thing. And we understand that it, it's literal, but almost because you know you can't feel it, can't touch it, if you want to say, we almost kind of look at it from a figurative sense because it's it's hard to, to, to understand and such. Uh, over the years, as I've been able to, to understand the kingdom, and I think my understanding just barely scratches the surface of, of what is there, and I'm still learning more, I've kind of become convinced that when we talk about the themes of the Bible, and there's a lot of them, and there's a lot of big themes, uh, for me, I believe that the key theme, overarching theme of Scripture is the kingdom of God. And redemption fits into that, that, uh, uh, that kingdom of God. And we'll see that a little bit here um, in, in the passage of Scripture this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and read uh, verses 50 through 57. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on, the, put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we have here to begin with in verse 50 of our text are two propositions. The first proposition is flesh and blood is not able, not capable, to inherit the kingdom of God. Uh, so the, the actual verb is, is uh, for power or capability. So we think of the word dunamis. That is the actual verb. Inherit is an infinitive. And so uh, uh, flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God. The second proposition is the perishable does not inherit the imperishable. And in the second statement, there is no infinitive. The verb for inherit is, is the verb. Uh, so it, it's a little bit different construction. But what's interesting here, and I want to point out, is we are not just talking about that the kingdom of God is imperishable. The two propositions, though somewhat linked loosely, are also exclusive of one another. So you notice here, this is the, the uh, I taken away this I say brethren, but you have the two propositions. So you can see uh, flesh and blood, kingdom of God, uh, to inherit, not able. That's the actual word order. And then you have the imperishable, uh, the imperishable, uh, uh, and it's not inherit because of the, the ude that we have there. So Uda is very, very significant. Uh, there's another uh, uh, one that, that is a little bit similar. Is you, Maybe you heard of Uteth. So Udeth and Uteth. It's a compound. You have the negative U, but you have death and you have teth. And what you have, and if you ever want to do some reading on this, uh, the best one I've seen that's kind of addressed the differences between those two, uh, Thayer, but Thayer is quoting... Uh, and uh, uh, commenting on another Greek grammar that, that addresses it. But why it's so significant here 
is for this fact. You have two things that are being placed side by side. They are loosely connected, but at the same time, they're mutually exclusive of each other. So Paul is not saying, just restating, that the kingdom of God is imperishable. I think we agree that it is imperishable. But he has something else in mind. And what's also interesting is that if you notice, uh, the perishable, the imperishable is Arthurus. It has the definite article. So I think Paul is making a distinction in these two propositions. Is there overlap? Is there connection? Yes. But Paul is not just trying to state the same thing. And so, you know, as you think about Hebrew parallelism, you may use different words for the same thing. Well, they're connected, but they're not closely connected. So that, that is a very important part because what we're going to spend quite a bit of time on with these two propositions is the second one. That's the one I, I want to spend more time on uh, this morning. Um, this here passage of scripture also, we must understand that what we are talking about here is the body. Uh, so we're not talking about other aspects of the kingdom because there are other qualifications for entering and inheriting the kingdom, Paul is only dealing with the body in this passage of scripture with respect uh, to the imperishable and, and of course, of, of the kingdom as well. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at the, the two uh, propositions. Uh, first of all, we have flesh and blood. So flesh and blood, I believe, refers to the earthly, uh, physical, human body. And there are a few passages of scripture that you see there. Uh, I'm going to, actually I want to get to the verses here real quick and then go backwards. These are just two of the verses. Notice in Ephesians 6. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So you can see that distinction of flesh and blood. And the other one, Matthew 16, 17. This is, of course, Peter's confession, as well as, I believe, the other guys, that, that Jesus is the Christ. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So I think when he talks about flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, uh, he's, he's speaking of, uh, uh, the the earthly present uh, uh, body uh, uh, that we have the physical earthly body, but now we come to kingdom of God, and when we talk about kingdom of God, uh, I believe that different passages of scripture, when they cite the kingdom of God, they are addressing an exclusive aspect of it, or maybe they may be looking at the overall arching uh, uh, aspect. Now, here in 1 Corinthians 15, because we're talking about something that is still yet future, does the kingdom of God exist today? Well, yes, it actually it's an eternal kingdom. So Paul has something in mind with respect to the church and the kingdom, but the perishable is, I think, even more narrowly being defined uh, by Paul, and when we look at other passages of scriptures, we'll see all these connections of the words, like corruptible and other things, uh, and that we will uh, bring into this. These are not all the aspects of the kingdom of God, uh, but the kingdom of God can be the overall eternal rule of God. So Daniel chapter 4, that's Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar is humbled, and what does he say? His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Uh, 1 Chronicles 29, 12, same thing. So the kingdom of God, does it exist right now? Yes. Has it always existed? Absolutely. Uh, now you have Christ's kingdom. Uh, Ephesians 5 and Colossians 1, 13. Uh, we think of millennial kingdom, uh, but also what Colossians 1, 13 is addressing. We have been transferred to the kingdom of his dear son. So I think from a positional aspect, uh, we are a part of this kingdom of Christ. What's interesting in Ephesians 5, and I, I never noticed it before, 
But Ephesians 5 is the kingdom of Christ and of God, and that's actually the Grand, Granville Sharp rule. It's the kingdom of the Christ and God. And, and so I think that helps connect because we see kingdom of heaven and we see kingdom of God and we wonder is it exactly the same thing. I think there's distinctions between them. Uh, but that's kind of a fascinating passage uh, in, in Ephesians 5. Uh, one that I've wrestled with for, for many years, kind of go back and forth with to the extent of it, a spiritual kingdom. So the kingdom of God is not uh, eating and drinking, but joy and righteousness or something in the Holy Spirit. Um, so it seems that there is a spiritual aspect. There's some other passages. How exactly that is, um, you know, I'm still studying out. Uh, but there seems to be a spiritual aspect to it that is probably right now. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure how Romans 14, 17, that, there's a, that, that's a pretty powerful verse. So, um, And then, of course, what we normally think of many times as a kingdom, we think millennial. But it's not only just millennial, but Daniel tells us it's not only just a, a thousand-year kingdom, but it's an eternal kingdom at the same time. Uh, so when you read kingdom of God, it could be one of different aspects. It could be narrow or it could be much more broader in scope. And so context, I think, is going to help us uh, in, in that way. So there is, I think there's a positional and experiential aspect even right now as we think about the kingdom um, of Christ so, and, and even the kingdom of God. Um, so we, we looked at the, the couple verses that we have there. But this is the one that I really want to focus on, uh, the second proposition. So the perishable, we, we come in contact with this word already in 1 Corinthians 15 when we talk about the resurrection body. So I think Paul is carrying over that thought that the body that decays, this flesh and blood, uh, also this, this perishable body that is decaying, it's corrupted. And, and at some point as it's in the process of dying, it will die. Uh, so that is, I think, the perishable. But what about the imperishable? And I'd submit to you that the imperishable, what Paul has in mind, is what we would call eternity. The new heaven and the new earth, the eternal state. Uh, that is, I think, is the distinction that Paul is making. So does the church have a role to play in the millennial kingdom here upon this earth? Yes, absolutely. Uh, uh, absolutely. I've always been intrigued in, in the New Testament. So John the Baptist's message, we're just going to take gospel story. What was John the Baptist's message? Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When John the Baptist goes off the scene, and Jesus' ministry, if you want to say, is in full swing, is Jesus' message any different than John's? Actually, it isn't. When you think about Paul's writings, and even Peter, uh, is not kingdom a very important part you see in these letters? And what also I find intriguing is that here is Paul as you come to the end of the book of Acts. And what is Paul doing? He has people coming and going, but what is he teaching about? is isn't saying he's teaching the gospel, and, and certainly the gospel is huge, but he's teaching about the kingdom. Interestingly, I think the main message of the New Testament is the kingdom, but redemption is a huge part of it. And we'll talk about that uh, in, in just a second here. So what we want to do is take a look at some passages of Scripture. I want to begin with the bottom one, uh, which is Psalm number 8. So Psalm number 8. And I think this is kind of an overarching uh, truth that we're, we're looking here in, in Psalm number 8. So Psalm number 8, uh, look at verse 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, 
What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? You have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hand. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. I think what Psalm 8 is saying is this. When God created man, God's intent was for man to represent God and to exercise authority over his creation. Why would God give that to man? You have angels and and heavenly hosts, and and, and, and the the unseen realm is, is huge. And why would you, this little old man, be a part of your plan to give him creation? You know, I thought about this. God did not create all of creation just to hoard it and say, look how great I am. God created all of it to give away because he's gracious. He's he's a giver. But what happened to man? He fell. Has God changed his kingdom program and who he wishes to give the kingdom to? He has not. But what is needed? Redemption. Redemption is needed. That's an important part of it. And of course, the kingdom being given to Christ as well. But in in Psalm number 8, I wonder if a little bit, we're not only talking about humanity, but also he has in mind Jesus Christ. In, in this passage of scripture as well. So with that in mind, uh, let's go ahead and turn uh, to uh, let's turn to um, let's go to Revelation chapter 20 and 21. So the quotation that you have there, we're going to address that in a second, but the quotation Uh, In Isaiah 25, it's also found in Hosea 13, uh, finds its way also when you come to to Revelation 20. So at the end of Revelation 20, you have uh, the lake of fire. And in verse 14 is this statement. uh, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Um, wait, you gotta give, uh, and, I, and he was seated on the throne, said, Behold, I am making all things new. He said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. And then verse 8 goes on uh, from uh, to there. So it's interesting uh, what you have here in Revelation 20. Now let's turn over to Isaiah 25. Isaiah 25. So Isaiah uh, verse uh, 25, verse 7 and verse 8. Now, um, in, in Isaiah 25, uh, the, the, in the Old Testament, so you want to keep this in mind about prophecy, sometimes what looks like one singular event in, in prophetic is made up of several events. 
and I think that is the case that we have here, that there's a lot of things being tied together, but this is the quotation about death being done away with. So we read in Revelation, when is this all going to be done away with, and when is this eternal state? We saw that in Revelation. But in 25 of Isaiah, verse 7, uh, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all peoples, the veil that is spread over the nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces. And the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. I think that what Isaiah 25 is referring to is not per se the millennium. Now certainly there's going to be peace and you have the new covenant and, and uh, you know Israel not straying from the Lord as a nation. But he's also bringing into this what I think is the dealing with death once and for all. There's still death during the millennium. But all of this is going to be gone at some point. And Revelation 20 and 21 points to that. Now let's go ahead and look at Romans chapter 8. So Romans chapter 8. So Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 14. Uh, it says in verse 14, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. I think the idea of Christ is going to be exalted king of all things, and there's a ruling and a reigning aspect with Christ over creation. We are heirs as sons. So what's important here and, uh, is that you probably know there are two words that are often translated sons, uh, technon and then huios. Uh, technon is, is the idea of more physical birth, descent. Huios is that of inheritor, uh, an inheritor. And that's what, what Paul is emphasizing. So the question is, inheritor in what way or of what? Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy, are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from the bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons the redemption of our body. So what is he tying together here? The creation is going to be purged, remade, uh, and who's going to rule over it? God's sons. God's sons. And there is somewhat of a condition to ruling in the passage is that we need to suffer with him. We need to persevere with him. So it's an eternal rewards uh, passage that we have here. But notice it's also tied to what he calls our adoption, and he narrows it down specifically to the redemption of our bodies. The imperishable is what is going to inherit the imperishable. That, and, and so there, I think, is the connection of what we find in our passage of 1 Corinthians 15 when you take into account Psalm 8, Isaiah 25, Revelation 20, and Romans chapter 8. And so um, uh, that's what we, we have there. And as I said already, God created all of this, this whole over which everything he rules, all that he created, his kingdom is over all of this. God wants to give it away to his sons. 
He wants them to have this as a gift from him and to represent him and to rule on his behalf over creation. When is that going to be? Well, you're going to have to deal with death. You're going to have to deal with corruption. And so as we, we kind of uh, draw a few main points from this, we can say, and I believe, that death was forever and completely conquered by Christ. And I would also say at his resurrection. But however, though, the demise of death is actually experienced in stages. So we didn't read it, but he goes into, we shall all be changed in a twinkling. When we talk about the resurrected body, that is preparing us, making us imperishable for being able to rule on God's behalf over his creation. But the, what we have now is a world that is corrupted. It, it's not getting better. Uh, it, it's not being healed. It's, it's de-evolving. And God is going to remake all things, and it is, it, it, it's, it's going to be now imperishable through new heaven and, and, and new earth. And so death's demise will be experienced in stages. When is death going to be finally dealt with? Not until the great white throne judgment, as we saw um, in, in Revelation. The second one is, is we kind of uh, went into it already, the transformation of New Testament saints' bodies for the future kingdom of God and the new heaven and earth was secured at Jesus' resurrection. That's the previous section we looked at yesterday. And then the rapture prepares the New Testament saints' bodies for their future inheritance. Now, there's an aspect of the glory of God that we discussed last night, but as far as our bodies becoming imperishable, that is, is at the, the rapture. And so God is preparing. God deals with our aspect of, of death from the physical standpoint, of course, at the rapture. And so you can see death being dealt with at certain stages, but there is a finality to it. So I think as we go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, uh, I think what Paul is doing is, yes, uh, uh, the kingdom of God, I think he's looking at it more broadly, but I think he's drawing attention to a specific aspect that's connected, but it is mutually exclusive, and I think he's referring uh, to the aspect of the new heaven and the new earth, and that becomes Paul's focus and how the resurrection fits into uh, God's kingdom program in 